Okay. Looks like we're live. I'm gonna begin. Welcome everybody to the Long 2020 series, our latest um, virtual event. Um, it's, hope it's sunny where you are, but thank you for being inside with us at your computer watching um, what I hope is gonna be a really fabulous talk. We have two philosophers with us today. Um, I should start by introducing myself. I'm Maureen Ryan. I'm the deputy director of the Center for 21st Century Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, and this event is put on by the Center for 21st Century Studies. Richard Grusin, our director, will say just a bit about that in a moment. Um, but first, I will give you a little bit of info about how the event will go. And um, I'll also introduce our speakers. So um, if you're joining us in Zoom, most of you are. There is a Q&A function that you can use if at any point. So the speakers are each gonna present for about 15 minutes. Um, then we'll have some discussion moderated by Center Director Richard Grusin. And then we'll open it up to everybody. And if at any point um, you're inspired or curious or perturbed by something um, one of the panelists says, you can throw a question in the Q&A and it will stay there and we'll get to them once we get to that portion of the event. If you are watching on YouTube, you can, um, we'll be moderating the YouTube conversation as well. So you can go ahead and um, leave a question in the YouTube as well. And we will grab it when it comes time to do that. So um, today's speakers are Megan Craig and Levi Bryant. And I'll introduce Levi first. Uh, we're going in alphabetical order by last name. Um, so Bryant is a professor of philosophy at Collin College outside of Dallas. His work revolves around issues of anarcho-communist political theory, materialism, realism, and ontology. He is the author of Difference and Givenness, Deleuze's Transcendental Empiricism and the Ontology of Immanence, um, The Democracy of Objects, and Ontocartography and Ontology of Machines and Media. He co-edited the speculative turn, Continental Materialism and Realism with Graham Harmon and Nick, I never know how to pronounce his name, Cernicek? Cernicek. I, I struggle with it too, yeah, so. Okay, um, so Megan Craig is an artist and associate professor of philosophy at Stony Brook University, where she teaches courses in aesthetics, phenomenology, and 20th century continental philosophy. Her research interests include color, synesthesia, autism, psychoanalysis, and embodiment. She is the author of Levinas and James Toward a Pragmatic Phenomenology, and is currently at work on a book on Levinas, Derrida, and palliative care in America. Her paintings, installations, performances, and public works have been exhibited nationally and internationally. Welcome to both of you. And I will turn it over to Richard. Thanks, Maureen. I just wanted to briefly welcome folks. Uh, I hope my feet is good. I'm doing this from the rural Kentucky, Ohio River Valley today. So since it's our spring break here at UWM. Um, anyway, this uh, event is part of our Long 2020 series, which features uh, writers who will be contributing to a volume of that same name, Long 2020, uh, published by University of Minnesota Press, um, probably sometime to early next year, we're hoping. Um, the point of the series, point of the volume was just to ask people to think about what seemed to be the longest year in at least phenomenally seem to feel like the longest year, certainly that I've lived through and I think uh, for many of us. And that year is both feels distinctive in itself, but also as we recognize uh, has its origins uh, way far back in uh, history. And also I think probably will continue to extend into the future as I think it is already extending into 2021. So. Uh, really looking forward to both Levi and Megan, who will be talking, in fact, about time and questions of temporality. So with that, Levi, I'll hand it to you. All right. Well, I, you know, I want to uh, thank you, Richard and, uh, and Maureen, for making this, uh, this possible and uh, the Center for uh, 21st Century Studies. And so <clears throat> the, uh, the tentative title of the article that I'm working on right now. And, and unfortunately, I apologize to all of you watching. I don't have a, a prepared talk here. And so hopefully you can help me to pull my thoughts together a little bit more. But the tentative title is The Pandemic Before the Pandemic. 
And so early on in the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, the uh, first couple of months of the pandemic, I wrote a piece um, entitled A World is Ending. And I, I did a sort of phenomenology of what I uh, was experiencing, how the pandemic seems. And it took a particularly, particular reference towards the future as well as the present. I was sort of working within a, a Heideggerian framework about the way in which we temporalize ourselves. And the way at least when we were here in Texas under total lockdown, I was experiencing things. It was as if we had lost this structure of temporality in this time. And uh, you know what I mean by that is that the horizon of the future, the way in which we project ourselves before ourselves in terms of projects, and things that we're working on, it seemed as if somehow it had been bracketed or wiped away. And we were now in a pure present that made it uh, difficult to think, to engage in any sort of project because, um, because it's as if the future just wasn't there any longer. All of that had been suspended. Um, and uh, this is particularly important to me um, in the context of the Anthropocene and climate change as well, because I think we are at a very material uh, level facing the possibility of a world without a future. And how do we continue on in a world without a future? How do we uh, go on? But <clears throat> in this particular article, I'm moving in another direction towards the past and memory. And so we have that dimension of the future and the way in which that allows the present to appear. And then we have the provocative questions that uh, Richard and Maureen have uh, proposed to us, posed to us uh, about the long COVID and the sort of roots of this crisis. And so the other day in my class with my students, we were talking about uh, the terrible snowstorm that we just had here in Texas. And uh, I mean, I, I've lived all over the country. I've known snow my entire life, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, where we would get feet and feet of snow, in Chicago, where your cars would get entirely covered. I've been through a number of uh, really, really significant snowstorms. And I have never experienced anything like this. It's uh, what, what my wife and I went through during that snowstorm where we reached uh, highly unusual in Texas, uh, below zero temperatures. And so our power uh, continuously went out for 30 hours. We had no power whatsoever. Um, it got down to the low 30s in our house. We were very, very fortunate because both of us come from up north and so we have winter clothes and we know how to dress for that. And we had a, we have a gas fireplace, but it's in a very open area. So it's difficult to get it heated. Our pipes froze. And at one point um, I was uh, gathering bucket after bucket, pot after pot of snow to melt, to put into the uh, toilet tanks. And so we could take care of that. And it takes a lot of buckets of snow to fill up a toilet tank. It's not a fun thing. And so I was, you know, my students and I were all talking about this. I think it was 18 people in Texas that died as a result of the snowstorm. And I, I asked them the question, is this a man-made disaster or a natural disaster that we just lived through? And they all answered that it uh, was a, a natural disaster. And I could see that, it's snow, it's weather. Uh, certainly there's an element of, uh, of nature here. But I bring all of this up in this context because the question that I'm asking may, may be a somewhat strange question because it has a, a, a kind of Kantian register to it, is what are the conditions for the possibility of a pandemic? What are the conditions for the possibility of that snowstorm that we lived through? How do these things happen? And it seems like an idiotic question. I mean, in the case of the snowstorm, okay, let's go talk to the uh, meteorologists 
and see what they have to say about how these storms form and uh, you know climate change and all this. In the case of the pandemic, right? Of course, it's obvious. It's true. Uh, as far as we know from the uh, the reports, uh, the uh, the virus was transmitted, uh, you know, through uh, through a bat in China, and then uh, it's a highly infectious virus and travels throughout the world, and we all find ourselves enmeshed within this situation. But I think there's more to it than that. I mean, it's uh, I mean, we can think in Deleuzian terms of the virus as a sort of dark precursor that leads to a sort of actualization, but we have this whole question of the severity of what has happened and the question of why it has had the severity that it has had. And so, you know, I, I, I think in a sort of way, it is undecidable in the case of the snowstorm. Is it a man-made disaster? Is it a natural disaster? Uh, on the one hand, this storm, I suspect, um, is, uh, is not a once in a generation storm, like uh, you know, people are suggesting a freak of nature. I suspect that it is completely uh, or, or deeply um, intertwined with the uh, accelerating effects of the Anthropocene and the way in which uh, humanity has changed the planet at all levels. And you know, I uh, I work with I'm a, a consulting scholar with a, a, a project out of Norway called Unruly Heritage. Um, it's a, uh, you know, it's funded by the Norwegian government and it is, uh, it's an archeological project. And when they first contacted me a few years ago, I, I, I couldn't understand why, why, why are archeologists interested in me? Why do they want me to come to Oslo and talk to them? What can I contribute? I don't know anything about this stuff. And uh, I said to myself, well, you know, I write about objects or I did in the past. Now I'm onto folds and pleats and waves and these sorts of things. But, um, but I said, okay, they work with objects. They're gonna be interested in that. And as I read up on their project, uh, it really threw me through a loop. Uh, I, I, I couldn't understand it. Uh, because what they're doing sounded like an oxymoron to me. It is uh, in an archaeology of the contemporary, an archaeology of the present. And so when I think of archaeology, I think of, uh, you know, Egyptian tombs and Mayan temples and, uh, you know, old Roman baths that are uncovered. <clears throat> the idea of an archaeology of the present is something that just doesn't seem to make sense to me. But what they are particularly interested in is, and, and one of the members of this, she would be very upset with me for using this terminology. They're, they're interested in the afterlives of objects. And uh, in particular, human artifacts. They're interested in ruination and processes of ruination and how nature and, uh, and uh, the, the, the different things that we produce intertwine with one another, sometimes uh, you know, substantially changing plant life in an area or becoming habitats for other animals. And so they, uh, you know, I, I went on an expedition with them where we were in the Arctic Circle surveying a Russian POW camp and parts of the uh, Nazi uh, Atlantic Wall. Um, we look at drift on beaches and, and you find that, you know, no matter where you are in the world, no matter how remote it is, we find the, the um, after effects of, of humanity in these places. And, you know, there was at one point a woman's boot had split open on the expedition and she was, you know, having to duct tape it up and uh, the water it constantly rained there still was getting through her boot all the time. And we could walk down to the shore and find an old fisherman's boot just that had washed up from a boat. And so when we ask this question, you know, what are the conditions of the possibility for the pandemic or, or for the storm? Well, it's not just the storm. I mean, part of why this storm was so severe is 
because of this dimension of memory. And so when they think of, of Bergson's memory, they're, they're, they're really, as archeologists, they're delighted by this thesis that the past is contemporary with the present. Now in Bergson, that is a, that is a spiritual statement, right? There is on the one side, the spiritual dimension of freedom and creativity for Bergson. On the other side, there's the material element that repeats. But the way in which these archeologists you know, make use of this, this thesis about memory is they materialize it. For them, memory is not something that is simply in the mind. It's not merely spiritual. It is material. It is out there in the things themselves. And so all of the things that are around us are different, I, I don't know how to describe it, uh, different levels or strata of the past that is persisting in the present. And these things constantly have to be navigated around. My house, for example, was built in 1993 and it was, it was uh, you know, built for technologies during that time period, there is a sense in which my house is a time capsule itself, and then you have to fit the new technologies into it and how they work together. And so in the case of the storm, what was it that made it so severe? It wasn't simply these cold temperatures and the amount of uh, unusual snow that we got. It was things like how the power plants were designed and taken care of, dimension of the past, decisions that had been made for economic reasons. It was the way in which pipes are built in uh, the, the houses here without any sort of insulation uh, to protect them from those sorts of temperatures. There had to be a whole series of human decisions, right? That we are living in midst to produce this sort of disaster that we lived through. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's I, I guess in Donna Haraway's terms, it's nature culture, it's not nature or culture. And it's the same thing with the pandemic. You know, with the pandemic, what I wanna suggest, what I wanna argue is that there was a virtual pandemic that was already here. And so earlier I made this reference to Deleuze's dark precursor that sort of sets off like a Jacob's chain, these processes of actualization that lead to the entity or the, uh, the situation that comes to be. Um, and I think it's the same thing with the pandemic. In some respects, the virus, right? It needed to have a sort of virtual field that preceded it that would enable this to take place or this to happen at all. And what was that virtual field? And I'm using terminology fast and loose here, right? The Orthodox Delusians would object to how I'm using it because I'm gonna talk about things that are actual, but it's gonna be the sort of rotting infrastructure that we have here in the United States. And so all of us experienced at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the, uh, and, and I still have anxiety dreams about it. I'd like to get a tattoo at one point of anyway, right, of, of the absent toilet paper that none of us could get a hold of uh, at a much more significant level. Uh, it would be the way in which, and this is the present and the past, decisions that were made about how hospitals function. And so, you know, decades ago, uh, they wanted to make it so that um, there were less than three beds per 1,000 people uh, available at any time, they were aiming at efficiency, right, uh, to keep costs down. And they were thinking about this all in economic terms. And so when something like the pandemic hits, right, that's a consequential decision that exacerbates the problem. We also encountered the whole problem of the absence of uh, uh, the scarcity of, of breathing machines, the ventilators, and all of these things that people need, the inability to manufacture on a large scale, the tests that would allow us to do these things, the scarcity of masks that people needed to prevent the spread of the disease. And then at the level of economics, we've made all of these decisions where that have eroded social safety nets. And you know, I, I'm not a fan of Governor Abbott here in Texas 
but I can understand the shoes that he's in. It's like Philip of Foot's trolley experiment, right? You know, they, we have the runaway train on one track, there are five people on the other track, there's one people, you pull the lever and decide who dies. Well, governance is constantly a trolley experiment, right? Do we lock everybody down and save lives? Lots of people are dying. Well, if we do that, people are facing job loss, imminent financial ruin. And no wonder they go a little bit crazy in these circumstances because you begin to rationalize things and uh, fall into denial. I've experienced it myself with certain traumatic things I've seen in the past. And you know, if with that job loss and that financial ruin, that's rises in domestic abuse and violence and uh, suicide and all of these things, what decision do you make in this situation? Well, we have to think about what led to the tracks in the first place, right? That's what constrains the decision. We have to, like in Gestalt terms, look at the background that structured this situation in the first place. And a big part of that was unemployment, right? Benefits and laws and the availability of those, the lack of a safety net, right? Uh, the inability for these things to sustain themselves over time. And then we have the third dimension, the semiosphere, the networks, the conceptual networks of meaning that we all dwell within uh, and of information. And so how the algorithms function on things like Twitter and Facebook, uh, the, uh, the siloing of different news sources uh, where people just get trapped in bubbles and they're living in completely different realities that again, right? How can we even address something like this when we can't even agree on what the reality is? And so this, all of these things uh, uh, that I'm trying to argue, and they are, are, they are a material past, it's right here in the present. All of these things I wanna argue are the virtual pandemic that preceded the actual pandemic. And they are all effects in one way or another of neoliberalization. So that's where I'm going. I hope that uh, that made some sense. I think that's, yeah, I went over a little bit. Sorry about that, Megan. Um, but these are the things that are kind of batting around in my head in this connection. Great. Thanks, Levi. Yes, thank you. Um, so Megan, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Levi. That was terrific. And thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Richard, for the invitation. Um, I'm afraid this is going to be a little stilted compared to Levi's exuberance because I'm going to be reading off the screen. Um, so let me just pull this up. Okay, so I have been thinking about the quality of time in the pandemic, and I don't want to suggest that there is one quality or anything universal about my experience of the last year. I'm finding myself less and less interested in philosophies universalizing theories. Instead, I hope to describe a few aspects of how time has felt to me and to connect this with the kinds of time Henri Bergson calls durée and élan vital, duration and vital impetus. So I've written two short opinion pieces for the New York Times in the last year that relate to time in the pandemic. The first one called The Courage to Be Alone detailed a walk I took with my then six-year-old daughter in March of 2020, just a few days after the first shutdown. It was freezing and we were walking every day, trying to find some measure of freedom and calm despite the feelings of isolation and global panic. In those early weeks and months of the pandemic, my children were a source of constant welcome distraction. They knew less and they were alive to their own realities. I tried to write about what it feels like to be present to them in this time. The tug between the intensity of my daughter's world of dolls, rocks and make-believe and the intensities of the wider world, illness, deaths, numbers of hospital beds, infection rates, an onslaught of metrics and numbers. I had planned to write about Emmanuel Levinas' short essay, Nameless, written 25 years after the Second World War, in which he talks about lessons a new generation, a generation born after the war, 
will need in order to survive. It's an essay I kept thinking about as I read about COVID patients in Italy and New York dying alone last spring. Levinas writes that the new generation will have to learn the courage to be alone in order to have the psychic resources required for a future time when the world might fall apart or abandon them. It seemed like such an urgent lesson for this time of profound and unevenly distributed isolation. But every time I tried to write about Levinas, to write philosophically, I was interrupted. I couldn't think straight. And I didn't want to try to teach anyone a philosophy lesson anyhow. So I wrote about the things closest to me and the feeling of starting to think only to be pulled relentlessly back into the world of pretend or the world of distance learning, listening in one ear to the sounds of my girls, listening in the other to the news, listening in vain for a train of thought that seems forever derailed. My second piece for the Times was written to appear on the winter solstice, December 21st, 2020, the shortest day of the longest year. I had wanted to title it The Present Tense, but editors at the Times were more pragmatic and wanted a title with viable search words. And so it appeared as time was never supposed to last this long. This essay, like the first one, follows the mundane arc of our life, this time from summer through fall. Rather than the rhythm of a single walk in the woods, I was thinking about the changing rhythm of seasons syncopated against the monotonous rhythm of laundry and dishes, the infinite loop of our chores and routines. I tried in this piece to express the tension between two times or between two rates of time that seem jarring, jarringly at odds with each other. One is the hyper intense time of being together in our small, small family unit at home. This time can have the feeling of being endless and infinitely slow, not because nothing is happening, but because there's so much repetition and waiting for something to begin and for something else to end. Someone is waiting for breakfast, waiting to sign on to Zoom, waiting for the Lego house to be complete, waiting for a play date, waiting for a vaccine. Initially, if the girls asked to see their friends, we would say, just wait. But this time has dragged on longer than anyone anticipated. And waiting is no longer something to exert special effort about. It's just how things are. In waiting, time feels so long that sometimes minutes can feel like hours. Pandemic time feels like that, slow, dragged, stalled. A lifetime ago, it was early March, 2020, and life had its variable pace and flow. And then it was as if someone changed the speed on a record player and everything seemed suddenly warped, suspended, stuck. The sense of being stalled is also, for better or for worse, tied for me to the Hamilton soundtrack, which we were subjected to on repeat from July through November after letting our daughters watch the movie on TV on the 4th of July. They immediately memorized the whole thing and spent hours reenacting scenes. Hamilton pits the frenetic man of action, Hamilton, against the indecisive man in waiting, Burr. It's almost exactly the difference William James imagined between two essential character types, one who James saw as the typically impulsive American man of action and realization, and the other a Rousseau-like dreamer who never musters the energy to do anything substantial. James thought both extremes were dangerous. I couldn't help feeling that Burr's song, Wait For It, was the soundtrack of pandemic life, more so in those months when we were also waiting for the election, waiting for the results, waiting for Georgia, and then after the violence of January 6th, waiting for the inauguration. Somehow we had been collectively cast as Burr, helpless, lying in wait. The repetition of Hamilton songs merged with the deadening repetition of the numbers of new cases, hospitalization rates, and deaths. The same soundtrack over and over with each new wave of the pandemic. 
But against this time of waiting, I was also aware of a different time, the time of spring, summer, fall, and winter, tracking the days in the weather and the budding of new plants, the early spring haze of green that seemed so indifferent to and at odds with a grim reality. I could only think of the first stanza of Seamus Heaney's poem, quite, uh, sorry, quote, sheer bright shining spring, spring as it used to be, cold in the morning, but as broad daylight swings open, the everlasting sky is a marvel to survivors, end quote. Nature wasn't waiting. It didn't care about the numbers or the protocols or masks or insurrections. This was the time of birds at the feeder, snow blanketing the apple blossoms, tulip trees in fits of gold. All of it seemed impossible to reconcile with the feeling of the pandemic, the centrality of the pandemic for human consciousness. Nature's time moving forward with steady disinterested regularity made me feel hopeful in the fact that human beings are at the center of so many calamities, but not at the center of everything. This other dimension of time relates to the deep time of geology Hugh Raffles has written about in the book of Nonconformities, Speculations on Lost Time, explaining that, quote, even the most solid ancient and elemental materials, materials are as lively, capricious, willful, and indifferent as time itself, end quote. It's the time that Oliver Sacks turned to near the end of his life in essays collected in the slim volume called Gratitude, writing about the bit of eternity in every element of his beloved periodic table, describing one of his last views of the sky powdered with stars, Sachs wrote, quote, it was this celestial splendor that suddenly made me realize how little time, how little life I had left, end quote. Two times. One, the human time of the immediate present that became over the last year slow, intense, and unyielding. And two, the inhuman time of nature in its unforgiving but life-saving flux. These two times have made me think about Bergson's descriptions of Dere and Alain Vital. Bergson described Dere in his 1913 text, Time and Free Will. There, Dere is tied to the intensity of psychic states, to time as it is lived rather than how it is measured or quantified by calendars or clocks. To give us a sense of Dere, Bergson famously invoked the example of waiting for a sugar cube to dissolve in a glass of water, time that only takes two or three minutes by your watch, but that feels like forever as you intently wait. He also says this is the time of memory and dreams, time that refuses to organize or cohere in a linear timeline. Duray is also the time of sickness or pain, time when the sheer agony of embodiment makes one wonder how or whether it is possible to endure from one moment to the next. In Time and Free Will, Bergson is worried that all of our mechanisms for dividing, counting, and measuring time have altered and obscured Duray, making us forget something essential about what it is to be alive. He's worried that we are becoming more and more like our machines. And so time and free will is a plea for us to find some ways of reclaiming lived time, of deliberately experiencing Duray as a means of reconnecting to the emotional depth and complexity of ourselves, each other, and life itself. But such intense involution is not without risks. And this has been a part of what interests me in connecting, in connecting Bergson with our own historical time. On the one hand, Duray seems to allow for individual, individuality and idiosyncrasy, for freedom and a heightened sensitivity to life. For Bergson, Duray is the only real time and to the degree that we can feel deray, we feel ourselves to be alive. Toward the end of Time and Free Will, Bergson describes the ways in which we are all suspended between two selves, a practical, social, surface self who meets the demands of the day, and a deeper, original self 
who dreams and feels and is tied to the unspeakable but vibrant current of life. He describes the ways that the deep self might be awakened through hypnosis or dreams, through trance-like transient episodes that crack and shed the veneer of the social self. Such episodes are paradigmatically instructive for Bergson, but he also cautions against a life lived entirely at the pitch of Duray. A person submerged in her deep self would be profoundly awake to life in general and profoundly asleep to any particular life. For the deep self has no means of social connection, no language, no signs, no way back up to the surface. We might say the person subjected to prolonged or indefinite durée risks becoming permanently or pathologically asocial. So while Bergson was worried that human beings were losing time and beginning to merge with their impersonal machines, he also worried that in reclaiming Dure, we might go mad and be forever stranded in some unending dreamscape. These feel like risks we are navigating today. We have, for instance, decided in America that the risks of COVID are greater than the risks of isolation for children who have been out of school for over a year. We have accepted that the risks of COVID outweigh the risks of isolation for those in long-term care facilities, for the chronically ill, and for so many others. Perhaps that's right and necessary. We have stayed home and stayed apart to slow the spread of infection and to protect those especially vulnerable to the virus. But Bergson reminds us of the double edge of DeRay that is relevant as we continue our vast experiment with social distancing. Many of us have grown closer than ever to the members of our own households, but we have also grown away from each other. Some have turned drastically in on themselves. And it's not at all clear what return means or will entail for those most abandoned to the prolonged DeRay of this time for those who have had to endure more, and especially for the youngest children in the most precarious positions who have known little else. The other aspect of time, nature and seasonal change, appears in Bergson's later Nobel Prize winning text, Creative Evolution. There, Bergson is not thinking about the deepening of consciousness for a single person as he was in Time and Free Will, but the array of consciousness over the whole of animate life, a kind of glistening field of life forms asleep and awake to varying degrees. He would like to tell an evolutionary story that is not reg regulated by any determinate mechanism or governed by the grand design of any finalism, religious or otherwise. Instead, he describes the ways in which life subtly and unpredictably implicates itself in matter like water seeping into the cracks of a parched field. It's an evolutionary story rife with detours, circles, and abandoned roots. It's messy and tangled, nothing like an elegant arc or neat design. In creative evolution, Bergson is thinking about DeRay not only in terms of individual human psychic time, but as what he calls elan vital, time considered at the scale of all life, a movement inherent in life itself that breaks up with explosive force into different tendencies. In Time and Free Will, Bergson had argued that psychic states are not discrete objects with definite outlines. Sadness, for example, shades imperceptibly into depression, which colors everything else. In Creative Evolution, he argues that life forms likewise blur and blend into one another. Creative evolution gives us a picture of life in the making and never fully made, a story in which human beings are the culmination of only one of life's multiple tendencies. While Dure bears down in its individuating insistence, Elan Vital spin spins outward in a dizzying multiplicity. Elan Vital reminds us that we as human beings are not the only or the final story reminding us of our contingent and tiny place in a vaster composition 
in which this time and this pandemic are barely blips. It's as if time itself can roll up into a ball or splatter like a jar of paint tipped off the table. Time is dense or diffuse, repetitive and new all at once. The audacity of the daffodils to bloom again as if nothing happened, the saving grace of every one of them. The pandemic has exacerbated the differential speeds of time, speeds that are also exposed in daily instances of brutality and joy lived out by different creatures in different measures all the time, and not only in pandemic time. While I find in Bergsonian DeRay reasons to be cautious about the long-term effects of social distancing and the feelings of stasis and blur, I also find in Alain Vital a reason to hope for more time for recovery and ongoing transformations. I'm writing about time now, just as earlier I boiled water for tea and folded the sheets to the tune of the Hamilton finale building in the background. We're caught in our own time at the same moment that we're entangled in time that outpaces us, caught in the tension between the before and the after, a hyphen elongated in the present tense. Bergson's sugar, Seamus Heaney's everlasting sky, Sax's stars, my girls singing, and the dog barking at a robin on the lawn. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Megan. Thanks, Levi. That was great. Um, so I think these were really uh, interesting papers to put in conversation with one another. I think that rhetorically, they took different styles, but I think both of them were approaching time in pretty interesting and if not compatible, certainly ways that will, I think, engage in conversation. As I was listening, I guess the first question that I would just throw out, and I don't have, uh, you know, I'd be interested just as a kind of almost thought experiment. It was interesting to see Levi talking about virtuality and virtual time and Megan talking about vital time. And I was thinking as both of you were talking, um, wondering if any of you had thought, had been thinking about viral time, that is viral time in relation either to the virtual um, or to Elan Vital, almost like Elan Viral. Uh, and it seems that in relation to the virtual, the reason I've been thinking a little bit about virus and viral time is that the virus itself is like individual viruses or even virality itself uh, has its own virtuality to it. Um, the virus, right, is, is, not, is not alive. It's a protein in a series of instructions that when it meets a spike, you know, ACE inhibitor or rather a ACE receptor, um, particular ACE receptor in the cell creates then this living cell that can replicate. But the virus without that is not actualized so that there's a kind of virtuality, I think, to viral particles that might be interesting to think about. Um, and then in relation to Elan Vital or Elan Viral, and this is all fairly uh, loose, as you can see, um, I was interested, you know, Megan, you were contrasting sort of lived human time with the kind of time of nature. And a couple things on that contrast. One, I was thinking a lot about Stephen Gould's uh, time zero, time cycle, and the way in which uh, time, at least in the West, has often taken these two contradictory models. But also in thinking about how the daffodils might work or how uh, trees might grow or how your children might be watching TV or whatever, it seems like um, it would be interesting for you to think about that in relation to the virus. What is what is time uh, for the COVID virus? So anyway, that's my sort of uh, non-human uh, materialist uh, attempt to get things started. And you can answer that. You can talk with each other. You probably have some things you might want to say there as well. So. 
take it away. Megan, do you have thoughts here? Um, Lisa, go ahead. Processing. Yeah, no, I'm happy no, I, to follow I, you if you have immediate thoughts. I'm processing. And so, I mean, what do you have in mind by the, the time of the virus? Are you talking about from the virus's point of view, like how the, the virus lives the world or the way in which we get caught in what I would call the orbit of the virus? And so, you know, it's a, a, a terrible, terrible story. Last Monday, my sister got her first stab. She was so happy about that. And uh, she, uh, for the first time, they've been so careful, ordering groceries in, kids completely homeschooled, right? Uh, her husband working from home. Uh, for the first time, they went to the mall. It was the first time the kids had ever gone to the mall. And uh, there was an active shooter. This was in Columbus, Ohio. And they ended up getting herded into a, uh, a very tight laundry room at the mall. Their social distancing was impossible. That evening, right, she begins to show symptoms. She gets a headache, body aches. She doesn't think anything of it. It's unthinkable, right, uh, that she could have gotten the virus. Next day, they get worse. By the third day, uh, she says, okay, something is going on here and goes and gets the test. And she, had, she has COVID. It's, it seems like she's getting better now. Uh, and of course, they weren't taking measures because they just assumed it was side effects of the drugs. And so we have two different temporalities here, right? We have the temporality of the, uh, the drug and how that led her to think about what she was going through. I expect side effects and all of these sorts of things. And then the temporality of the virus where we get, where we get caught in uh, the sort of gravitational orbit of the virus in our lives. And uh, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing it's such a strange virus because unlike the flu or a cold, right, that has a sort of arc to it that it intensifies and then it tapers off, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the virus, it, it has a wave-like pattern. It comes and it goes and so you feel better and uh, you think, okay, maybe I'm gonna be fine and maybe it's over and then boom, the next day it hits you you know, once again, and so we have that level of just experiencing the, uh, the virus and the way in which temporality is structured in that case. And then there is the life cycle of the virus as a whole throughout the entire globe. Um, and uh, the, the way in which socially all of us become trapped within the orbit of this, will it be two years? Will it be the rest of our lives that we're dealing with? Uh, you know, a lot of these pandemics, they seem to last about two years and then they disappear, but who's to say? And so I don't know if that resonates with any of these sorts of questions that you're asking about viral time. And, and, and I, I mean, I do, you know, like in my previous piece, one of the things that I talked about is, is, is apocalypse, right? Which in its, its original meaning, it means to be revealed. And, and that's something, we have this, this dysfunctional thing here in the United States where apparently, I, I can't get my head around it, but people just think of themselves as isolated individuals that are independent of one another. I should be able to freely make my choice to not wear a mask or get vaccinated or something. But one of the things that's being revealed is the way in which we are all interdependent. I mean, we can't, we can't do this alone. And it's not just, you know, this herd immunity thing. It's not just if we reach 70% in the United States, then the virus will die and will taper off. It's <clears throat> Brazil. It's all these countries in Africa. And, and uh, you might think nationalistically, hey, this is just up to us. We don't need to worry about those things, but we're realizing what was the expression, Richard, we used to say when we were children, our parents would say to us, that matters about as much as the price of tea in China, which, you know, it meant this doesn't matter at all, but the price of tea in China matters to us, right? It might seem far away. What's going on in Brazil matters to us. It could mean a timeline, a deray of this virus 
for decades to come because of evolution. And sometimes creative evolution isn't so nice. <laughs> it's, uh... Yeah, thanks, Levi. I mean, I, what I was maybe to uh, clarify a bit, Megan, before you take a crack at this, I mean, I was thinking in part about wanting to distinguish between the virus and the disease. And the, so some of what we talk about, the pandemic across the globe and things like that, that's, uh, that's human time. That's, you know, human and non-human, but I mean, it's the sense of what the disease is doing. And the disease clearly is in a certain sense, virtual, the pandemic in terms of its outbreak, in terms of how it's actualized, because it's this kind of pool of uh, potential infections. Um, but the viral time, the virus doesn't care about humans or non-humans, about the borders between us. Our concepts don't care. Really, for the virus, it's just about making that connection uh, with that spike protein, just about this kind of um, what really what the virologists actually call mediation that produces uh, the disease. So I guess partly when I was thinking about Elan Viral as well, you know, I was thinking about the difference between the disease, which would fall into our sense of deray, and whether, or really just wondering whether the time of the virus is a time of Elan Vital that is indifferent to um, our human longings, memories, whatever, values, um, or whether it's not a, a third time altogether. I don't know. Um, time is not my, uh, <laughs> not a time, but Megan, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, it. I think, you know, this discussion has raised a lot of really interesting, um, a lot of interesting points. And I like the, I mean, the, the phrase, Elan, Viral is a, um, that's a really interesting evocative phrase. I think what you just said, I think it follows along the way I was sort of originally thinking of reacting to this, which is that it, you know, it seems to me that if we talk about viral time um, and especially if we're talking about this particular virus, um, at least in the way that Bergson initially describes the Elan Vital as, you know, not being a singular like shot from a cannon, but being more like these, um, these explosive and like ongoing explosive, um, what is the right word? It's not the shot from the cannon, but it's the, um, you know, these, it's like contemporary ammunition that we see that explodes again when it hits matter. That seems very much like a description of the, the kind of force of the viral force or the, the shape of the viral force. Um, and I, I guess for me, I think it, it feels important to not kind of, um, I don't know, to not kind of think of the think of the virus itself as, um, as on the, I guess on the paradigm of like the bad guy or like in this sort of like comic book world of like, there's something that's out to get human beings and to destroy them. Um, because I think it's part and parcel of this broader indifferent milieu in which we are enmeshed that's not about good versus evil. It's not about these sort of very human kinds of ca categories and characterizations. And I personally find something sort of hopeful in that because, um, because it's not reducible to, to some familiar human frame. Um, so that's a little terrifying, of course, on one level, but that's also an invitation to, you know, to really try to think creatively or to try to move outside of the boxes that we've been moving in. And in that way, you know, I think that Levi's discussion about the virtual pandemic that's just um, prefiguring the pandemic and, you know, 
that is part of our addiction to the kind of fixes and boxes that we've always liked to use so far. So, you know, I don't want to say that that COVID like provides opportunities or something, you know, to sort of make it into this Pollyanna-ish kind of account. But I do think that something about the impersonality, the indifference and the sheer kind of, um, you know, force of this virus is, uh, is not reducible to a familiar human frame of time or of, of anything else. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, piggybacking on that point, I, I kind of like the Pollyanna-ish, <laughs> uh, you know, possibility of, of what you're saying there, because, you know, I think, uh, <clears throat> I think we have these fundamental distinctions that uh, work throughout at least Western culture, where we have uh, one term that is always treated as the lower term. And, uh, you know, so uh, matter is treated as the lower term with uh, spirit as being the higher term. Um, culture is treated as the higher term with nature being treated as the lower term. It, it's really interesting to me, all these things that are related to our finitude and, you uh, that we have to navigate, right? Uh, that are impediments to, you know, maybe our fantasies of, of omnipotence or something like that, that stand in the way of that. We give a, a lower value, almost as if we want to repress this materiality and this nature. And I think in, in some respects, I don't know. I mean, did we, maybe I'm making too much of a generalization here, but uh, didn't we think nature was gone. I, I, it's uh, as if it's, uh, it was a crossed out word. We've conquered it. It's gone. We don't live within nature. We're within society. We're within culture. And I feel as if with the virus, it's, you know, revealed, it's disclosed of how it's right there in the middle of us. We, we can't separate ourselves in that sort of way. And so what the pandemic becomes an opportunity to think is that sort of embeddedness and that flat plane that you've been talking about, if I'm understanding you correctly, about the, when you were talking about the temporality of nature and it still follows its own rhythms. And I like very much, you know, what you have to say. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's, you know, the, the virus isn't an enemy that's out to get us. I mean, all, all the virus wants to do is replicate itself. That's just its agenda. Um, it's just interested in replicating itself. Uh, what, what do they say in the business world? It's nothing personal. Um, and to see ourselves as entangled, right, with those sorts of things, I think is as you know, the the Anthropocene intensifies and climate change intensifies, is a really important way of thinking. Yeah, Lipa, I mean, just reacting to that, I think that what you've just said also highlights the, um, you know, the way in which we're so easily tempted into falling back into the like war paradigm for dealing with anything that is experienced as a threat to humanity. Um, and then, you know, we've seen that in the medical realm too, that in any number of diseases, cancer is probably the paradigmatic one, but the idea of the war on cancer. Um, and I think over this last year, we're not only seeing the exposure of all of these weaknesses, structural, societal, political, all of these different weaknesses that have always been there, but we kind of saw the exacerbation of that mentality with a medical system that was falling apart, that had, no safety net for people that was leaving so many people behind to begin with. And suddenly it's sort of in war mode against this enemy, this invisible enemy. And that was bound to fail. I mean, that was a failing paradigm. So, you know, I think- How can we even begin in the United States when our healthcare is tied to our jobs and then suddenly everybody's out of a job? It's bonkers. Yeah. 
I, I mean, that that's part of the virtual pandemic right there. You know, it's uh, sorry to interrupt you, but um, that hit a nerve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, but I mean, so many of these things are conceptual too. That's, that's what's crazy to me. I mean, it's not just the infrastructure and the, the paychecks and, and the healthcare. It's ways of thinking that seem to organize the, the field um, and our responses to it. And that, I mean, that's some of what I think we can offer as philosophers. Can we give, you know, it sounds like you're a good pragmatist, but can we get a radical empiricist anyway, but can we give conceptual tools that allow us to, to better think through these things and respond to them? I want to bring in a question, perhaps, if this is a good moment to do that. And I actually don't know what the question is, but I, I'm going to do something I've never done before, which is allow to talk. And I'm doing that because I, um, Arijit, our colleague UW, at UWM, Arijit Sen, who's an architecture professor, um, has his hand raised. And so Arijit, I'm going to hit the button allow to talk. And I believe that means you'll either be audio, video, or both. Let's see. Okay. I love the parentheses uh, talking. <laughs> uh, I am actually, I, I didn't intentionally raise my hand. <laughs> the, the, the phone is in my pocket. I apologize. I'm, I'm listening to you guys. Okay. But um, I don't have a question really. Sorry. Caught up in your, the time of your technology. I will mute you again then. Um, I wonder then, this is a good chance for me to ask my question. Um, and that is about the, you both used interesting um, spatializing metaphors. And Levi, you just mentioned it off the cuff that you are now more interested in kind of folds and loops and things like that. And Megan, at the end of your piece, you talked about, um, I'm blanking on the metaphor. Will you, I'll think of it in a second, but you also were responding to the last question that Richard raised, talked about time as the, um, or the, the virality, the time of the virus as being akin to the kind of ammunition that explodes on contact. So you have these like interesting metaphors for conceptualizing how time is experienced. And I think that's useful because time is really felt and lived. But I wonder if each of you could elaborate a little bit on what, um, what you mean by those and what those metaphors get you. I also should say I'm not a philosopher by training, so I, um, I may be asking a very remedial question, but I'm curious about it. I, I mean, I'm happy to, I'm happy to say a couple of brief things. I mean, the, so the, that metaphor of like cannonball versus exploding on contact ammunition, that's that's Bergson's from the beginning of creative evolution. Um, and so, yes, his use of spatializing metaphors for uh, for describing time are well-documented and problematic in all kinds of ways. Um, but what I would say is, you know, I, I guess that I have really turned to descriptions of, um, like the, these very kind of banal descriptions of what is happening in my life um, as a way of trying to evoke this simultaneous like feeling of real slowness and repetition and like what, it, what day is it, what's happening that is together with this other sense of like, I know that's not everybody all the time. Like, you know, I, I have a kind of abstract awareness of somebody's in an emergency room right now and things are happening fast. And, um, and so, yeah, I guess I've had recourse to, I guess I don't think of it really as spatializing description, but recourse to description as a way of trying to trying to kind of connect across this experience of kind of like isolation and loss of connection with other people 
Um, and that ends up being stuff about like all the the kind of housework and you know the walk again and the Legos again and um, it's at that level of stuff. Yeah, and in my earlier piece, that's that's what I was trying to capture that feeling exactly like you describe of just this. Is it empty time? I don't know. I mean, it has its own intensities and everything like that, but also, you know, the nature of how our house has changed in the early months of the pandemic. Um, I would only go to the grocery store maybe once every two or three weeks. And so, and, you know, we would get things ordered in. And so in the foyer of our house, we have a big pile of boxes with goods in it and everything. My wife's car out in the garage has become a pantry with canned goods on top of it and uh um you know our uh, our counter is a disaster as well just this like you say the sort of isolation that's almost uh like a bunker and um i mean going to this idea of of folds you know like the way i'm trying to think of objects in in my second book i, I had argued I think mistakenly now, uh, you know, quite strongly for the independence of things, right? Uh, their separability. And there are reasons for that. Um, but now I'm trying to think of things that pleat and fold the larger than object world into them, right? Uh, and so, you know, the way the tree grows outside it's not just internal to the tree and like its genetic map and everything like that. It's the way the wind, you know, regularly blows and it has to navigate that wind. And so it folds that wind into itself, leading it to grow in this way or in that direction. It's the way it has to navigate the growth of the other trees as they strive for light and all of these sorts of things. And so there's also the pleading and folding of us that you're so beautifully talking about in your, your paper there in this isolation, right? How do we get pleated and folded? I, I feel so fortunate to have been trapped in this home with, you know, I, I think she likes me. and I, I mean, we seem to get along pretty well um, during this time period. It's not so great for everybody else. And then I think of the people who are without anybody else, maybe a cat, uh, maybe a fish, maybe not even that. And what happens to you in that sort of space? And, and I know that it's led to changes in me paradoxically. In some ways, I've become much more gregarious. You know, it's like one of my deans will call me and next thing you know, I'm having some sort of conference. Hey, what's going on with you? And uh, things that I would have never done in the past because just being so starved, right? For some sort of human contact and interaction. I had to go to a meeting the other day that was on campus face to face and, uh, you know, I wanted to cry as I saw these people that I hadn't seen for months. And, you know, this, this, this woman that has, has mentored me and everything, she's, she's now emeritus. Uh, you know, she comes walking in for this meeting and uh, we give each other kind of a virtual hug, a, an air hug from afar. And she says, wait a second, what am I doing? I'm, I'm vaccinated. How about you? And I said, well, I've got my first shot. And she said, it's good enough. And she just you know, tackles me. And it's, and it was overwhelming to feel that touch from another person. And that's sort of the, the, the fold of this, this isolation, um, the way in which it, I, I don't know where to go from there, um, but the way in which, at least for me, it's changed the way I think about some of these things. Thank you. That was really beautiful and and clarified some things for me. So, um, yeah, and I mean, it, it's other things too. You know, my my daughter, our daughter, she she's had to be in isolation with us. That's led to different sorts of relationships. She's had to form different kinds of relationships with you know her friends in the area and all of this sort of stuff. And and so, what does that do to a child after you you know a year to to be constantly just with a couple of adults? Musical taste has gotten much better. <laughs> um, whether or not that means you're listening to more or less Hamilton, I don't know. Maybe you can let us know. Um, 
Arijit has a follow-up question actually. So I'm, but he wrote it in the, Q, the Q and A. So I'm gonna bring it into our conversation. Um, he says, I do have a confused question as I ponder the contemporary moment. And that has to do with history and the future of history. How do we write the history of COVID if we were to use the Bergsonian notion of Jure? Um, I mean, Bergson would tell you that, you know, you can't talk or write about Dere. So <laughs> there is no, um, there is no history in that sense that would be possible. Um, but I guess that's why, you know, Bergson confronts that problem in his own work. He is writing and he is talking about the very thing that he says is not expressible in language. Um, and, you know, I guess I can express a hope I have, which is that um, in this time that there are people at work in, um, you know, in creative registers documenting their own experiences, documenting what they're seeing, documenting, you know, a whole, a whole range of things beyond what we might ever see included in a traditional like historical sweep um, in a textbook or like on the History Channel. Um, so I guess I'm more interested in that kind of history of history of private life, history of um, a kind of history of intimacy that I think this time lends itself to and, you know, would through whatever it was, you know, maybe it would be like, you know, um, some kind of, it, it could be, I don't, it could be anything like some strange exhibit of like knives and spoons or, you know, whatever it's, whatever has loomed large for whatever reason in this time, I think has been very different for everybody and has been different based on the lived condition that, that we, one finds themselves in. But that would be a history I'd be really interested in, I think would, um, would at least provide a kind of emotional resonance of the variability of experience that people are really having despite, you know, it's like pandemic, but um, we're not pandemos. We are so deeply idiosyncratic in our range of privileges and states that we find ourselves in, in this, um, in this situation. So yeah, intimate histories. Thank you. I think that's really interesting. And it, it brings to mind some projects that I have heard of where people are trying to document through kind of ordinary archival practices, like the, what it has felt like to live through this moment. And I think, you know, I was trying to think about how it might be different, what you, what you would tell your children, your grandchildren. We always think those things of ourselves when we live through some kind of great historical crisis. And um, I mean, what seems most pertinent and most real is to talk about the knives and spoons or whatever it is, your experience of time and how none of us, we all have time blindness now and all of these things related to the kind of felt conditions of, the, yeah, the intimate histories you're describing. But I must, but I have to assume that's the case for a lot of other historical crises as well. I mean, I'm thinking back to like how people talk about World War II um, and like the way that people felt in the kind of in hiding if they were hiding from the Nazis or whatever it was. And that that does play into the way that we talk about historical events on a grand scale. Um, but I do think there is something, I mean, perhaps precisely because it is so amorphous, our experience of the pandemic, it's like no one knows where it is or when it is, um, that it makes it seem, it animates it in a different way to be able to talk about it in this intimate um, context. You know, Maureen, that makes, it just makes me remember that uh, probably the first week, you know, after schools closed and we just were like in that lockdown first moment, we handed um, our daughters each a, a blank book to keep their thoughts in. 
And my older daughter, you know, immediately started to like write all kinds of stuff. And this went on for a little while, but my younger daughter <laughs> looked at this book. She turned it to the very last page. She drew a big box on the last page and in like huge block letters, she wrote the end. That was it. That was the extent of her engagement with journaling the pandemic. But I thought, you know, it was so instructive because I was like, well, that's, you know, that's really from a child's point of view, what you want out of this is to know that there that there's the last page that you can see your friends again and go back to school and um yeah so i always keep that in mind like we should all be able to project at least some version of the block letters the end in whatever way we need to yeah and that's well i was going to say that's what makes this a different kind of historical crisis than perhaps World War II, but no, that's, I, I can't even say that either. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, we have another question I wanted to throw out, and this is from Sarah Vanderhagen, who's um, also UWM faculty. She's a fellow at the center this year. And she says, I really appreciated these reflections on our experiences of time during the pandemic. They reminded me of Geraldine Brooks's book, Year of Wonders, which is about a woman's experience in a plague village in England in the 17th century and how humans have been experiencing these things for thousands of years. What, if anything, do you think might be different about our experience of time in this particular pandemic, similar to what follows on the heels of what we were just talking about? Well, I guess, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is like digital culture um, and the way that, you know, I think that um, it's clearly, it's facilitating this event. It's facilitated like some measure of school and other things and connection for people. Um, but I guess, you know, well, I don't know this book, Year of Wonders, but I'm going to look at it as soon as we finish this call. <laughs> um, but I think, um, I guess one thing I would say is I feel that we are living in a time of unprecedented speed and, um, and that that has its own effects and um, has, you know, in this, again, Levi's idea of like the, the virtual ongoing pre-pandemic, that's a part of that too. And the, um, the ways that, that time um, has shifted under the effects of digital culture and the ways we have changed as a result of digital culture. So I think, um, I don't know, that just seems like an important thing historically to bring into the discussion if we're talking about thinking these very different time periods that are linked by experiences of pandemic. <clears throat> Sarah, is that book fiction or is it nonfiction? I mean, it's, I, I just think back to the Spanish flu, which is similar in some ways to, to what we've lived through. And I, I can't imagine what it would have been like Right, uh, you would have, and, and I wouldn't exist. It's a terrible story. I wouldn't exist if, if it weren't for the Spanish flu. Um, but to, uh, to not have these sorts of digital technologies, uh, time would be suspended in a certain way, uh, especially if uh, you didn't have a whole lot of books or if you were not literate or something like that. It would just be a, a time of, of waiting. Um, <clears throat> and I know that uh, until recently, um, I didn't feel like we were, uh, Megan, gonna be able to even envision, that's what I mean about wiping away the horizon of the future, that the end to this this sort of situation. I mean, it just just didn't seem like it could end. Would they successfully make a vaccine for it, or is that a long shot? Will it ever happen? 
Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in, uh, in the case of, of the Spanish flu, my uh, great grandfather, his wife succumbed to it and uh, died. And, uh, you know, and he was a, a, a poor tenant farmer. Um, and uh, they were all very poor. And uh, the family down the dirt road, they had a daughter uh, that, uh, you know, they had too many mouths to feed. There wasn't any work to go along. And they, so they said, take our daughter, marry our daughter. And she became his second wife. And that's where all of us came from. And it's this horrible story to think of yourself as coming out of this thing. Uh, you know, maybe I'd like to write a novel from her point of view someday, this woman. But, um, I mean, we have, many of us have come to live in this, virtual reality during this time period, you know, this, this online world endlessly scrolling to see new information. Uh, and uh, it's, it's intensified certain things in that world in some ways, but it's also very stratified because we have all those people who are essential workers that are daily going out into the world that are having a very different experience of time during this this time period. I don't know, Megan, are, are you in the classroom? We're in the classroom here. We're part online and part in the classroom, but. Yeah, no, Stony Brook is remote. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, I feel like, so yeah, that the feeling of isolation um, in a world where you don't have access to the news and all of the instantaneous kind of metrics that we've had access to and you don't have the connectivity. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's impossible for me to even imagine that kind of situation. At the same time, I feel like the radical connectivity that we live in now is part of the problem. And, um, you know, the, I, I think about this especially at the level of my kids who have been just shuttled onto these platforms that up until this moment, I've spent so much of my time making sure that they're not on, that they're not, um, you know, that they're reading books and they're not on these different apps for whatever. And that was completely taken out of the hands of parents if your children were gonna be involved in school anymore in this in the same way that they had been before and so you know in those cases I feel like the kind of the way in which the um the way in which digital media allows for this constant ongoing like deflection of attention like you can always find and dig for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing um exacerbates isolation you know and it, and we see that in in social media that it's just an exacerbation of of isolation that people are just finding their echo chambers and staying in them more and more mm -hmm. so in some ways you know i i don't know i don't want to compare like <laughs> who has it worse or what's what's the worst situation i wouldn't want to compare that but i you know i think that it's really complicated to think through this experience as it's unfolding because we really are in this vast social experiment right now and we do not know what what the outcomes of it will be especially for um for the youngest kids who you know are now you know now just spending so many hours consecutive hours and who are who are learning socialization on zoom with all of the delay and lack of nuance that that entails without having some precursor to know that that's weird or that's not all there is. Interestingly, our, dis our daughter discovered phone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of my students say to me uh, that the, uh, the phone on our phones is just an app. You know, they, don't, they would rather text back and forth, which I think is a very uh, different sort of experience. But um, but I mean, you know, it's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm blended. Part of some of my courses are face-to-face are -face, and it's, it's a very weird format 
because each class gets split in two so we can maintain social distancing. And so I meet with 14 or 12 students on a Tuesday and the other 12 on a Thursday. Um, and so there's no way to really effectively structure lectures in that way. I don't uh, do this nightmare hybrid high flex model where you're streaming out to the other half of the class. And then with the online teaching, there's almost no outside to it ever, right? It's, it's omnipresent. Uh, and so there's a collapse of the separation between the, uh, the domestic and the, uh, the work environment that I've, I've been working on. But I think, I think you're absolutely right on mark with this sort of endless you know, scrolling and then finding ourselves falling into these echo chambers that are uh, strangely even more isolating, even if perhaps you found a community of people. Um, recently to spend more time with my daughter, I uh, <clears throat> ended up uh, taking up skating, online, uh, inline skating. And uh, um, it's like to rediscover the world out there again is a strange thing. <laughs> it's like, look, there are leaves. Look at the configuration of that concrete and everything like that. I've, I've discovered that I have a body. I didn't know, I think, before that I had a body. I knew. Right. Um, but uh, none of that would have happened if it weren't under these circumstances. Can I ask perhaps one more question? I know we're getting to the end of our time. Um, or maybe it's just a comment. And I think it's sort of for Levi and sort of following up on my previous question about the folding. I mean, I think this is why I was curious about the metaphors of how present and past are touching each other in these layered ways in our experience of time. But um, you said something about Levi, um, the failure of the grid in Texas and how these are sort of like accreted decisions of the past in the present, so the past is in the present. But I was also thinking about how like the present, there's like a presentism to the way past decisions were made, specifically around like policy. I think one of the problems that I've been thinking a lot about lately is the ways in which politicians have no incentive to plan ahead for anything. And that there's always a short-term decision to, to um, so, to appear to solve a problem or to kick it down the road rather than face the like very real infrastructural problems we have. The problems with climate change obviously are this way as well. And so, I don't know, I was thinking about that as something as well that the that presentism, that kind of thinking um, is also part of the problem, um, the problems of the past that are now again. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. I talk a little bit about this in my book, Onto Cartography, and I, I forget exactly how I put it. I start by talking about uh, the uh, experience of time for flies and um, why it's so hard to hit a fly uh, because they encounter motion at so many, I, I wanna say it's like so many Hertz. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and so right, they, they, they have a very quick time and their, their perception and their openness to the world. And I try and expand on that idea that um, if we think in, in Kant's terms of, uh, of our experience of time as, as being a sort of <clears throat> structure of mind, uh, well, I think there are all sorts of different rhythms uh, that we can think about um, that impact what we can deal with, right? And so when you just, when you look at the way our government is set up, it, uh, the structure, I mean, we're glad that we have these terms and everything like that, but the, the structure of that makes it very difficult to deal with the sorts of problems that we have right now, which require long-term thinking. As you, you know, you have the two-year, term, the uh, six-year term, and the four-year term. And so they are immediately having to think about re-election. And then when you bring in the temporality, which I think has been a catastrophe for the world, when you bring in the temporality of the 24-hour news cycle and the imperative of the news cycle, right, is to perpetually 
create more information because if we just say it's sunny, it's sunny, it's sunny, people tune out. And now the politicians have to constantly be you know, responding to that news cycle. Uh, and so we don't have a, a structure the way it's organized that temporally allows us to deal with these big large derays of the sorts of problems that we face right now. And I, I'm not sure how to crack that nut um, and, and what to do about it. I think it's important to be aware of it. And I mean, it's been, you know, like on the one hand, you know, Megan talking about uh, the sort of repetitive time that we've been trapped in. And, uh, you know, for me, the suspension of, of time in a certain way. On the other hand, right, you know, I, when I think of everything that's happened in the last four years and then everything that's happened in the last year, I just, I can't keep track of it all. You know, sometimes I'll remember some tidbit or something like that, but I mean, it's just, it's just been one thing after another without, uh, you know, I, I begin that other piece, a world is ending. And, uh, you know, I ask myself, within a sort of Kantian framework, do I still have a transcendental unity of apperception? Am I still an I think? And so there's a sort of unity to the, to the mind that structures our past experience and our future that we're striving for and creates the present. And I feel as if I've disintegrated into fragments, right? That I don't have this sort of temporal unity any longer. Maybe Thanks. I should seek help. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, right. We all are fragmented. <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Megan, and thanks, Levi. This was really interesting. Looking forward to your papers. Thanks, audience, for your attention. And um, we'll see you, I don't know, Maureen, next week? Yeah, we have a talk on Thursday, the 8th of April, with um, American Studies and Women's and Gender Studies scholars. Uh, Rebecca Wanzo and Roderick Ferguson. Great. Looking forward to that too. Thanks all. Yes, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Megan, you it was a pleasure to meet you. You too. I hope and we I really enjoyed more. your take. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a really beautiful talk that you gave though. And uh, thank you. I love the way you're making use of all that stuff. I'm